Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is staying healthy and sane. All right. Um, so today's lecture is about the short story entitled Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, is there anything you want to say to the class? I want to say that you guys miss me a lot and lots. And I got this uh, Fortnite shirt that my parents got me. Who is this? It's a tomato. Um, and why, why does he have the pizza cutters and the pizza? Because he loves pizza. He loves making pizza too. Does he have a name? Uh, it's, it's just a tomato man. Okay. I All could right. call him a tomato man, but I don't know what's his name actually. So if you know his name, um, look in Fortnite if you have that skin. Okay, so. Bye. Alright, bye. Right, so uh, you learned something new today. Um, so I hope everyone's doing well. Um, yeah, I mean, what else? I miss you guys a lot. We terribly miss you all more than y'all can possibly imagine. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed the short story for today. I love Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I, I highly recommend you read um, Play Your pa Piano. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool, intensive, dystopian novel. Although, you know what? Living in the times right now, maybe you shouldn't be reading that. Maybe you should read Big Little Lies, which is what I've been reading all weekend. I can't put that damn book down. Um, so, for next time you are to read the I Had a Dream speech and um, the letter from Birmingham Jail. Okay, I'm also going to talk about um, the bombing of the Birmingham church as well so that's going to be pretty heavy topics we're talking about next next time and the topic for today of course it's very heavy as well um the book that i am going to recommend for you all today is marvels this you all know i love comics okay this is actually a really cool um graphic novel this this set of comic books was released in 1994 yes okay it was released in 94 i understand it's probably your parents age Oh, God, I'm old. Anyhow, um, it is four comics in one. This is the, like I said, this is the graphic novel. And it's really neat because what it does is it takes um, the idea of, this, of superheroes um, and brings um, a, a reporter, brings up a reporter to tell its stories. Okay, it's really cool. It kind of takes the what if notion if you were a photographer in New York taking pictures of these um, superheroes. So, for instance, there's a part here... All right, so here, okay, so it does talk a lot about the Avengers, but it also talks about the X-Men, and it talks about what happens when the Sentinels come to town, and these mutants are being, um, persecuted, okay, I don't want to tell you what happens in it, but, um, this guy, he's a reporter, he's actually affected by a little mutant, and it kind of puts himself in that situation. Anyhow, if you can, if you're interested, Marvel's is a great series, you can get it in a little paperback, mine is really old. Okay, mine's been around the ringer, so um, I highly suggest you get it. It's a great, um, it's it's a great set of stories. So yeah, read it. Okay, on for today's story, Harrison Bergeron. I hope you all enjoyed it. I told you all this was going to be a dystopian um, story. It's fairly short, which I know you all are very happy about. Sorry, I don't remember which one of my dogs is that right now. Okay, so let's look at. Uh, 3059. Um, Kurt Vonnegut is a great writer. He's an incredible, incredible writer. We lost him in 2007, unfortunately. His um, most famous work is Slaughterhouse Five. Okay, um, I told you all that Player Piano is fantastic as well. Um, Cat's Cradle is really good. I've never read Cat's Cradle. I've only read Slaughterhouse Five and Player Piano, so I can't really recommend anything else by him. But he's brilliant. I love the way he writes. He um, takes up current events very well. And this short story was actually written in 1968. So this is the height of the, of the Cold War, of the Red Scare. McCarthyism was actually a short memory away. Um, and pretty much everything that was going on in the 50s and 60s comes to a head here in Harrison Bergeron. Okay, so Harrison Bergeron is a dystopian short story. On, it talks about the danger of complete equality. Okay, now I want to explain a couple of things to you. So, the American Declaration of Independence just does state that all men are created equal. Okay. Um, 
But to say that honestly everyone is on a playing level field is incorrect, okay? You know, just because I am an American woman, does that mean that I can go out and play basketball with the great of them? No, y'all, I'm 4'11", okay? I cannot play basketball, okay? Um, does that mean that I could go and get into a wrestling ring and wrestle, you know, a guy who is maybe twice my height and outweighs me by 200 pounds? No, that's not going to happen, okay? And what Kurt Vonnegut is saying, okay, all men are created equal, cool, but do not try to make a completely play, um, a completely equal playing field for everybody. He goes, that's not going to work. That's communism, okay? And, um... Kurt Monigut, what I do like about him is that he goes after a lot, um, he goes after different entities, okay? There was a point where he would go after the American government. At this point, he is going after communism. And he's saying, y'all, communism, it doesn't work, okay? Giving the equal distribution of wealth and land, it's not going to work, okay? It, just, it really doesn't work. And he's saying the same thing. He's saying, look, right here, Okay, if you want to talk about communism, if you want to say equal distribution of everybody, everybody's equal, he's like, that's not working. Okay, it's really not. Um, I was going to talk about college and stuff, but I'm not going to talk about that right now because I love my job. Um, but I think the I think the, the message that um, Kurt Vonnegut is trying to tell you guys here is that, hey, you know what, complete artificial equality doesn't work. And he's talking about that in Harrison Bergeron. So let's go ahead and get started, 2359. The year was 2081, and everybody was finally equal. There weren't only equal before God and the law, okay? Because, you know, all men are created equal. That's what we talk about, right? Being equal before God and the law. No. They were equal every which way. Nobody was smarter than everybody than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th. 212th and 213th amendments to the Constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. Okay, so right now GAM establishes government controls everything. Okay, there is equality. Everyone, okay, every, nobody's better looking than anybody, nobody's smarter than everybody else. Does, am I the only one who thinks that this could be a completely boring life? Right? Wouldn't it? Because where is the joy in life? Where, where are the emotions? Um, where is the thrill in watching, um, I don't know, Liverpool lift the Champions League trophy in 2019, right? Where is the fun in that? Where are the films? Where are the television programs? Okay, this is just, everyone's equal. It's quite dull, don't you think? Some things about living still weren't quite right, though. April, for instance, still drove people crazy by not being springtime. And it was in that cl climbing month that the HG men took George and Hazel Bergeron's son, 14 year old son Harrison, away. Okay. It was tragic, all right, but George and Hazel couldn't think about it very hard. Hazel ha had a perfect average intelligence, which means she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And G George, while his intelligence was way above normal, had a little mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like, like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. All right, so that's oh, that's a huge, huge couple of paragraphs that we just went through, so let's break them down. We hear that, first of all, George and Hazel's little boy, Harrison, was taken away by H. G. Men. All right, so this is the government that will take children away from their parents. We've talked about this right once before. That's not very kosher. Okay, obviously not very kosher here either. Any government like this that takes away people's children should make us feel incredibly uncomfortable. All right, if this dystopia is sounding familiar to you, this is a familiar trope, okay, that is um, that's repeated in other dystopias. Okay, the, set, the third paragraph we find out that um, these two characters are different, right? Hazel has a perfect average intelligence, which means she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. Okay, and George, his intelligence is way above normal, so George would be one of you all. Okay, obviously somebody very, very intelligent had to wear like a little earbud. I don't, I don't have my um, earbuds with me. Do you have your earbud? 
on you. Okay, I don't have them, but you can imagine these little earbuds that go in your ear that something, some sort of sound um, rings in your ear every 20 seconds. Okay, that would drive you up the wall. Okay, that would drive me up the wall. Imagine some static every 20 seconds. You guys would be wearing this, okay? Because that would keep you from um, taking unfair advantage of your intelligence because you're more, te more intelligent than other people, right? Okay. George and Hazel were watching television. There were tears in Hazel's cheeks, but she forgot for the moment what they were about. On the television, television screen were ballerinas. A buzzer sounded in George's head. His thoughts fled in panic like bandits from a burglar around alarm. That was a, a really pretty dance that, that they just did, Hazel said. What? That dance, it was nice. Yep, said George. He tried to think a little bit about the ballerinas. They weren't very good. No better than anybody else would have been anyway. They were burdened with sash weights and birds, bags of bird shot, and their faces were masked so that no one seeing a free and graceful gesture or pretty face would feel like something the cat drug in. George was toying with the vague notion that maybe the dancer shouldn't be handicapped, but he didn't get very far with it because before another noise in his ear, radio scattered his thoughts. George winced. So did two out of the eight ballerinas. All right, so let's go ahead and um, talk about this part right here. It's almost ludicrous, right? To have to think that you're sitting there at every 20 seconds beep, every 20 seconds beep, okay? That's very ludicrous, and there's nothing really to be done. They're watching um, this, this show on television, but it's, it's pointless, okay? They're just sort of watching these little figures go around, and you're reading it, and you're reading how ridiculous this idea is, right? That everybody is now equal. Um, even that, that short paragraph, right, that, that these ballerinas, and any of you all who have ever danced would understand this, how difficult it is to dance with sash weights and the bags of birch sh shot, and then the masks, and of course that little just that little um, earbud that some of them have to wear. I mean, what's the point of all this? There is, there is absolutely no point here, okay? You all watch, I don't know, whatever it is y'all like to watch on television, for me is football, right? We've talked about this all semester. Um, <clears throat> whenever I'm watching English football, if I'm watching Liverpool play, I'm sitting here, yes, I am nervous, I'm a wreck. Um, I'm usually at the bar with my husband and my kid, we're watching the match um, at 9 o'clock in the morning. I don't drink, guys, okay, so I'm, I don't drink. I'm drinking coffee at this point. Um, but you're watching it for the enjoyment, okay? I'm watching Liverpool because I like to watch it. Some of you all like to watch, I don't know, baseball or some sort of film. Like, if you're watching a film, um, you're watching it for the enjoyment. Sort of forget about your life for a bit. In this case, they're not. They're being reminded of this extreme equality. Okay, so this is incredibly ludicrous, all right? This is ridiculous, but like most dystopias, or all dystopias, I should say, there is a stem of truth in it. We could see this happening. Okay, this is something that, that could happen, all right? Um, let's look at the bottom at 3060 before we, we go to the real um, gist of the story. Okay. He began, um, this is right here, um, he began to think glimmeringly, and this is, um, George, okay, George is remembering his son, right? Uh, look at the bottom of 3060. George began to think glimmeringly about his abnormal son who was not in jail, about Harrison, but a 21-gun salute in his head stopped that. Boy, said Hazel, that was a doozy, wasn't it? It was such a doozy that George was white and trembling and tears stood on the rims of his red eyes. Two of the eight ballerinas had collapsed to the studio floor and were holding their temples. Some of you all suffer from migraines. Can you imagine when you're, you've got a headache, right? It's just noise going off again. Okay, this is what's happening to George. Um, I would say this is torture. This is, this is torture that's, that, that's happening to him and the other two ballerinas. But it keeps going. And I love this scene right here with Hazel. Okay. All of a sudden, you look so tired, said Hazel. Why don't you stretch out on the couch, on the sofa, so you can rest your handicapped bag on the pillows, honey bunch? She was referring to the 47 pounds of bird shot in a canvas bag, which was padlocked around George's neck. Go on and rest the bag for a little while, she said. I don't care if you're not equal to me for a while. 
Alright, so George has that thing in his ear, but he's also carrying 47 pounds in the back right here. Okay, so this guy's probably doing this, trying to have having to carry it, okay? And Hazel is an incredibly compassionate person. When you're reading dystopian literature, it is very difficult to find somebody who's um, who's compassionate. It's really, really hard. But we have Hazel here. She's different. She's very compassionate, right? She's saying, hey, nobody's going to notice. Can't you just rest it? Okay. George weighed the bag in his hands. I don't mind it, he said. I don't notice it anymore. It's just a part of me. Okay, like 40, yeah. 47 pounds, guys, can be a part of him. You've been so tired lately. Kind of worn out, said Hazel. If there was some way... We could make a little hole at the bottom of the bag and just let a few of the lead balls, few of, and take out just a few of the lead balls, just a few. Two years in prison and two thousand dollar fine for each ball I took out, said George. I wouldn't call it a bargain. If you could just take out a few when you came home from work, said Hazel. I mean, you you can't com you don't compete with anybody around here. You just sit around. If I tried to get away with it, said George, then other people would get away with it, and I'm pretty sure we'd get back to the dark ages again with everybody competing against everyone else. You wouldn't like that, would you? I'd hate that, said Hazel. There you are, said George. The minute people start cheating on laws, what do you think happens to society? Okay, so, change is bad, right? Okay, change is bad. Um, everyone is equal through the government, but this is complete control. Okay, and I love Hazel because in this entire story, Hazel is just so compassionate. She wants to help her husband. She wants to keep this pain away from her, right? When we love people, um, we want to be compassionate toward them. Okay, and even if you don't know the person, you still feel bad, right? My husband and I and my kids were in line um, buying donuts for a veterinary office, and like two cars in front of us was this this gentleman and his little boy on a bike, okay, and the little, little boy falls over, so I almost jumped out, okay, we felt really bad for him, okay, you feel compassion toward um, people who are in pain, but um, it says a lot from George saying, no, we have to follow the, the law, even at home when nobody else was going to notice, right, no, no, we have to follow the law, okay, the law says that I have to wear this 47 pound um, a bird shot on my neck, okay, no, the, the, the law has to be followed, okay, this is complete control that George is under, right, and yet it's the one who is above, who is average intelligence, who is saying, hey, just kind of keep it over here, I won't say, and you know that from just kind of seeing the, the way that Hazel speaks, um, do y'all think that Hazel would tell on George? Um, not necessarily, no, okay, but still, George doesn't want to give give up this um, control. Okay. <coughs> okay, look at the bottom of thirty sixty one. Okay, randomly, right? They're watching the stance occur. Um, okay, I am. Okay, this Harrison walks in, right? I am the emperor, cried Harrison. Do you hear? I am the emperor. Everyone must do what I say at once. He stamps his foot, and the studio shook. Okay. Every, even if I st even as I stand here, he bellowed, crippled, hobbled, sickened. I am great. I am a greater ruler than any man who had ever lived. Now watch me become what I can become. Harrison tore the straps of his handicap harness off like wet tissue paper. Tore straps guaranteed to support five thousand pounds. Harrison scrap iron. Handicaps crashed to the floor. Harrison thrust his arms under the bar of the padlock and secured his head harness. The bar snapped like celery. Harrison smashed his headphones and spectacles against the wall. He flung away his rubber ball nose, revealing a man that would have awed Thor, the god of thunder. I am. I shall now select my empress, he said, looking down at the cowering people. Let the first woman who dares to rise to her feet claim her mate and her throne. A moment passed, and then a ballerina arose, swaying like a willow. Harrison plucked the mental handicap from her ear, snapped off her physical handicaps with marvelous delicacy. Last of all, he removed her mask. She was blindingly beautiful. Now, said Harrison, taking her hand, shall we show the people the meaning of the word dance? Music, he commanded. All right, so all this comes crashing down, right? Um, Harrison goes in. Obviously, he's this, um, he's very scary to them. If you go back to 3061, screams and barking cries of consternation came from the television set. A photograph of Harrison Bergeron on the screen jumped again, and as, and, 
jumped again and again as though dancing to the tune of an earthquake. Okay, so there is something happening. There's some consternation. Of course, this is not normal, okay? Remember, in this land of complete equality, everything is dull and boring. So this is something, it may not be an earth, a general earthquake. It is not literally an earthquake, but it's something is happening, okay? So to somebody who has had, who has been controlled, okay, who has had what I call, okay, a boring life, Okay, this is something, something is happening, and we find out that this something is Harrison. Okay, Harrison Bergeron, this, this obviously now um, almost man-like creature, right? Well, who does he remind you of when he's tearing everything off of him, right? Does he remind you of somebody? Think about it. Um, to me, he reminded me of the Hulk, when the Hulk is sort of tearing his clothes off. Kind of reminded me as well. Okay, y'all can discuss if he reminds you of the help or of any other character, okay? But this is um, monstrous, okay? Kervani Good is making him sound almost like a monster. But at the same time, um, this is nature. Okay, nature abhors a vacuum. Nature will change, okay? We learned that in Jurassic Park, right? Life finds a way, and right here, even though... Um, his parents were controlled, their every movement is controlled, somehow someone like Harrison is still going to live, okay? Humans are not meant to be controlled and to be completely equal. We're not, okay? Okay, everyone is different. Even if I have two identical twins in my class, they're gonna be different. Okay, I've had them, guys, completely different people, right? Okay, people are different, just like no, no one finger is the same. Okay, people are going to be different, and Harrison is still born. That is the flaw to the system. The system is not going to work for long. Hey, and they keep dancing, right? Okay, this is absolutely wonderful, um, you know, scene with Harrison and the, the ballerina dancing. The television program was suddenly interrupted by a news bulletin. It wasn't clear at first to what the bulletin was about since the un announcer, like all announcers, had a serious speech impediment. For about half a minute in a state of high excitement, the announcer tried to say, ladies and gentlemen, he finally gave up and handed the, bu the bulletin to a ballerina to read. Okay, so this is another sort of very ludicrous point right in the story where the, um, announcers have a speech impediment. Why? So that nobody else thinks that they are lesser than them because they are announcers. That's pointless. An announcer is supposed to sit here and read something clearly, right? Why would someone with a speech impediment be an announcer? I mean, see how weird this becomes? Okay, the world's turned upside down. It's topsy-turvy. This makes absolutely no sense, but in this dystopia, it makes perfect sense. Okay, and that's something that I want you all to keep in mind with dystopias. And, and we've talked about this in um, the first, the very first story of the semester, right? The thing with dystopia is nothing makes sense in it. Um, if you're reading, for example, Fahrenheit 451, which is one of my favorite books, um, those of y'all who haven't read it, please go read it. I'll, I'll talk about it next time. Joe, remind me to talk about Fahrenheit 451 next time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, it doesn't, like, like in any other dystopia, something that would obviously be wrong, okay, makes perfect sense there but that's the problem right is this is wrong this should be happening but it is making sense to them it makes sense okay that's the scary part right is you don't quite know who's in control until something like this happens so let's keep going right here um Ladies and gentlemen, said the ballerina reading a bulletin, she must have been extraordinarily beautiful because the mask she wore was hideous, and it was easy to see that she was the strongest and most graceful of the dancers, for her handicapped bags were as big as those worn by 200-pound men. And she had, had to apologize, of course, at once for her voice, which was very unfair for a, for a woman to use. Her voice was warm, luminous, timeless melody. Excuse me, she said, and began again making her voice absolutely un uncompetitive. Harrison Bergeron, age 14, she said, has escaped, has just escaped from jail where he was held on suspicion of plotting to overthrow the government. He is a genius and an athlete, is under handicapped, and should be regarded as extremely dangerous. A police photograph of Harrison Bergeron flashed on the screen upside down, then sideways, then upside down, then right side up. The pictures show the full length of Harrison against a background calibrated at feet and inches. He was exactly seven feet tall. Wow. Okay, so he's 14 years old and seven feet tall. And let's look at the um, handicap. 
the rest of Harrison's appearance was Halloween and hardware. Nobody had ever worn heavier handicaps. He had outgrown the hindrances faster than the HG men could think them up. Instead of a little ear radio for a mental handicap, mind you guys, this was in 1968. Okay, this was written in 68. Okay, little earbuds were completely, um, like they weren't even on the table yet. And it's amazing how these um, scientific writers can be thinking of this, right? How um, Ray Bradbury writes something similar in uh, Fahrenheit 451. Instead of the little ear radio for mental handicap, he wrote he wore a tremendous pair of earphones and spectacles with thick wavy lenses. The spectacles were intended to make him not only half blind but also to giving wrangling headaches besides. All right. Um, we're about to finish up the video right now and go on to another one, but I want to leave you all with this. I mean, this idea that he has to wear these um these eyeglasses just to give him headaches because he's too smart for everybody else. Okay, this is horrible torture that's being given to a 14 year old. Never mind an adult. Okay, George, he's an adult. Okay, we adults could take it, but to see a 14 year old child have to do this, okay, that's incredibly painful. So um, let's go ahead and go on to the next video, okay?